Welcome to another interview uh, in our FM Expert series. We've got Greg Markham with us. Hi, Greg. Good to see you. Hi there. Um, Greg is the Estates and Asset Director at Serco Health and is going to share with us uh, some of his insight really on the risks around compliance, which is uh, his specialist area. So, Greg, I'm looking forward to this. Over, over to you. Thank you, Beth. Um, yeah, so uh, 30 plus years in FM, um, but learning every day because every day is a school day. So hopefully some of what I share today can be of use to others. Um, so compliance, what is it? Um, everybody's got a different idea. I like to break it into statutory and mandatory. Yep. Uh, the analogy would always be the car because most people have a car and understand that. If it's more than three years old, you have to have an MOT certificate, excluding the current COVID exclusions, but nonetheless, under normal circumstances, that's statutory because it's illegal to have a vehicle over three years without a valid MOT. Yep. Mandatory would come down to the service thing because uh, the requirements are that you should have a vehicle that's roadworthy and by having it regularly serviced, that's a measure of compliance. But it's no guarantee of okay. and you may well self deliver it. You don't have to go to a, a garage to have it done. Um, so that would be the, the start of a 10. Understand what's statutory and what's mandatory. And mandatory typically is uh, following a code of practice to try and demonstrate compliance. Yeah. But even following a code of practice does not mean you are compliant. Yeah. Um, but it is a reasonable defence should the person in the curly wig be asking the questions, God forbid, one day. Yeah. Um, so, so around that, I guess the most important thing for compliance is understand what it is that you need to do. Yep. Uh, there's lots and lots of information out there. Um, but uh, Google's a great place to start, but do... Uh, weed out some of the suspicious uh, stuff that's on there if it looks too good to be true it generally is um, and I guess the other side to it I don't recall anyone being prosecuted for trying to do something yeah um, if you do your best and you're making all reasonable steps usually the enforcement authorities will give you some guidance and may provide uh, uh, create an enforcement notice but they tend not to prosecute because yeah. they recognize somebody who's who's got goodwill and is trying to do their bit yeah, absolutely um so so from there where, where do we go so understand what your personal liabilities are as well as your business liabilities um as fms we tend not to um try and burden our businesses with risk we try and hang on to it and keep it but if you're not properly funded and you're aware of the risk and you haven't communicated that upstairs and passed that risk upwards then you could end up being culpable and liable and that's not a comfortable place to be. And that's you wanting to do the best for you and for your business. But actually what you're better off doing is articulating the risk, articulating the cost and allowing somebody else to take that responsibility on. Yeah. Uh, every organization has an ultimate duty holder, usually the chief exec or yeah. whatever that be, to make sure you've got a channel to that person and make sure they understand the implications of whatever it is they're deciding to do or not to do. Yeah. and keep a record an email's fine a diary note's fine but please do that yeah i always tell my people um think forward three months an incident happens tomorrow in three months time what would you do looking back yeah that you wish you'd done that's reasonable yeah um because it's the age old holes in cheese it's not one thing it's a multiple stack of things and any one measure can stop it turning into an incident yeah but when those line holes do align what could you reasonably have done yeah if it's down to reasonableness of cost or reasonableness of time then you're guilty yeah if it's because uh, your business didn't see that there was a reasonable cost or reasonable time then articulate the argument but allow somebody else to make that decision and then take responsibility for it, not you. Yeah. We're all um, cost constrained at times, but our job is to articulate the risk, articulate the cost, and allow the decision makers to understand what the benefit is of spending that money. Yeah, because because like you say, you know, the decision makers uh, may not have a clue about this stuff. So <laughs> it's often the FM who's kind of explaining it to say, we need to spend the money or we need to take this action. Yeah, okay. And you're often not part of the core business. So all you are is a cost to that core uh, business. Yeah. It's difficult sometimes to articulate value, particularly in hard FM. We're there for things not to happen. Yes. And, and go back to the car servicing again. We all begrudgingly pay for a car being serviced, but we all suspiciously think, 
but would it have been any different <laughs> if I had to spend that money? Would it not have broken down? Yeah. Um, and, and some of that is with um, our lords and masters, you know, the, the senior C-suite, they have to understand that some of this is absolutely necessary to prove they're doing all that's reasonable to keep the people that are safe, that they're in their care. Yeah. And when you step across that threshold onto a building, you are in the care of whoever owns that building. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's another aspect as well as a tenant, don't be shy of challenging your landlord yeah. for their co evidence of compliance. That's a really good point. I get that question a lot on training and people say, am I okay to ask for a copy of the risk assessment? Am I okay to ask for how they're managing water services? What would your answer to that, Greg, be? Absolutely. You're not yeah. just okay, you absolutely should. Yeah. And record the fact you've asked for it. So preferably do it in an email yeah. um, and record the response. If you get no response, diarise a reminder every week and keep nudging and nudging until, be the pain in the backside yeah. until you get the response that you need. Because yeah. that might be what you rely on in court, should anything go wrong. What sure, you've done your yeah. Yes, absolutely yeah. that. Yeah. We, we don't, thankfully, mercifully, these court cases are rare, because in FM we tend to look after people and we tend not to have huge consequences. But there are examples where it has happened. Yeah. And ignorance is no defence. Yeah. So be aware of what you need to do, be aware of what you need to know and who the responsible party is. And if it's your landlord, be absolutely insistent on proof. Yeah. And to be honest, most landlords, if they understand there's a responsibility, they'll have the proof ready and available. Yeah, they're just they're just trying to avoid it and they're busy and yeah, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. I love that so far. Anything else for us? Because this is good stuff. Um, yeah, so don't follow the old adage of if in doubt, contract it out. You can contract <laughs> things, which is fine, but you can't contract the risk and the duty holding. Yeah. And don't go to Google for your supply chain. Make sure there's some rigor about who you're selecting. Understand the risk of what it is. If it's something that you don't technically understand and know, try and reach out for some support. If it's something technical, let's say lifts, we aren't all experts on lifts, but at least you should understand what it is that you're asking the lift contractor to do. Yeah. Make sure the risk assessments and method statements come through. Yeah. And whilst we may not understand the detail that's in a risk assessment or a method statement, there are things that we do understand like PPE. Yeah. And if it says there that they should have safety footwear, and long trousers and a long sleeve shirt and they turn up in uh, sandals and shorts there's a big clue that mm, maybe this team isn't quite on form yeah and don't just file the risk assessments and method statements read them and say hang on a minute what does this mean let's go and walk the job have a chat through it what do you mean when you say that's going to happen be inquisitive and ask questions because and, they, too many people have it as a tick box tick box tick box exercise don't they and the number of times i've had a crew turn up and say well i've nothing to do with that that comes from oh. office well, no, it's your risk assessment method statement. You should know what's in it. Tell me what it is you're going to do and what I should be seeing in this method yeah. statement and risk assessment. And don't be shy about that. It's yeah. that reasonableness thing. Yeah. You, you can get contractors that have got SSIP uh, yeah. registration, so safe contract, construction line, and I would absolutely advocate that. Yeah. But that's a measure of past performance. It's no guarantee of future conduct. It's a really good point. But you've still got to do your own checks on site. Really good point. And you've also got to understand that you need to provide that contractor with the context of your site and the risks on your site. Yeah. They may be absolutely competent at maintaining that lift, but they don't understand that to get to the plant room, they've got to go through a hazard area. Yeah. Or that yeah. there's some other work going on nearby that might affect them. Yeah. You as the controller of the premises, you absolutely should know that and you should be briefing that out. Yeah. So an induction program, even if it's a whiteboard on a wall with all of the work that's going on in an area, yeah. some form of control so that everybody in your team understands what's going on to make sure there's no chance that one contractor could compromise another yeah. or something that's going on on site that day could compromise them. Um, for example, again, we use the lift contractor. There's a, there's a generator test that day. Yeah. If the lift contractor's on top of the lift car dropping it down the floors and the power goes out, well, at best, they're going to be very worried. At worst, they may actually be injured yeah. or affected. Yeah. So let them know there's a generator test at one o'clock. The power's going to go off. Yeah. Make sure you're clear of that lift shaft and add it to your checklist that day to make sure somebody's checked in with that lift contractor and they're not on top of the lift car yeah. when you're going to turn the yeah. power off. Yeah, I, I mean, it sounds like it's such a silly, basic, obvious thing, but God, you could probably give me... 
20 examples I could give you 20 examples yeah so so communication both ways is key um great we could I mean literally we could talk all day I'm just looking at the time but I think can we book another one in because you are brilliant at this stuff of course you can. and you explain things in such a straightforward uh easy to understand way so thank you so much I'm gonna I'm gonna say thank you for now but I will get you back <laughs> no problem